This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you are in the future because you're listening to Christina Gomez and Shifting the Paradigm. Howdy, folks. This is Lou Elizondo, and you are listening to my very good friend, Christina Gomez, on Shifting the Paradigm. This is Ray Sobs from the Unex Network, and you're listening to Shifting the Paradigm with the intrepid Christina Gomez on the X. You're listening to the Unex Network, KUNX DV, Kansas City, Missouri. Welcome to Shifting the Paradigm. I'm Christina Gomez on the Paradigm Shifts channel and on the X, the new mainstream KUNX digital broadcasting talk radio. Are you ready for this? Because we're about to embark on an hour and a half of UFO shenanigans and paranormal adventures. Right here is where we look and think outside the proverbial box. We jump down those rabbit holes where you get a red tic tac instead of a red pill. First off, make sure you subscribe and share these shows on social media to those who you think are having their minds and eyes open to the reality of the UFO mystery. All of these shows are great primers. And in the push for more clarity, transparency, and disclosure, the more voices demanding answers, the better. Let's get into some unusual news from this last week. If you have $55 million to spare, you too can go to space, more specifically the International Space Station. On April 6th, the mission, which will launch from Florida's Kennedy Space Center, will see three amateur astronauts, along with one experienced one, launch aboard a SpaceX Crew Dragon. This mission, which is being carried out in partnership with Axiom Space, will be the first all-private flight to the International Space Station. The crew will consist of a Canadian investor and philanthropist, Mark Pathy, U.S. entrepreneur Larry Connor, and ex-Israeli Air Force pilot Etten Steb. Once aboard, the crew will spend eight days conducting scientific and technological experiments in the station's weightless environment. The future is space, and there is no argument there. We can't forget that Jeff Bezos has just launched Blue Origin. As it says directly from the Blue Origin website, it reads, For the benefit of Earth, Blue Origin was founded by Jeff Bezos with the vision of enabling a future where millions of people are living and working in space for the benefit of Earth. In order to preserve Earth, Blue Origin believes that humanity will need to expand, explore, find new energy and material resources, and move industries that stress Earth into space. Blue is working on this today by developing partially and fully reusable launch vehicles that are safe, low cost, and serve the needs of all civil, commercial, and defense customers. In time, maybe 50 years, perhaps 100, there will be a sufficient amount of humans inhabiting more than just Earth. In other news, based off of the Smithsonian Magazine, moon dust from the Apollo 11 mission will be sold at an auction on April 13th, starting at a little under a million dollars. While the samples collected have had a great deal of importance to scientific data, NASA has met with an unexpected problem. 
keeping the samples out of the hands of private individuals who might seek to profit from them. Over the years, the space agency has been involved in numerous lawsuits designed to keep lunar samples from being sold to the highest bidder. And for the most part, it's been quite successful until now. The dust will be auctioned at the House Bonhams in New York, despite NASA expressing its discontent at the move. Enough with the news. Let me talk about today's guest. My guest is a dear friend, a mentor, and co-host for Mysteries with a History, Jimmy Church. Jimmy is host of the famous international radio show, Fade to Black Radio. Fade to Black is a late-night, long-form conversation talk show with a style that is a throwback to the old days of overnight AM radio with open conversation with guests covering UFOs, ghosts, lost civilizations, secret governments, agendas, time travel, and alternate realities. Jimmy, welcome to Shifting the Paradigm. How are you this evening? I am fantastic. This, you know, is, this is awesome, and this is an honor, Christina, and uh, thank you for the invite. Seriously. Well, this is so exciting. And while you're on Mysteries with a History every Thursday, uncovering amazing mysteries with me, today is the first time you have been a guest for an interview. So let's get into it. You ready? I'm ready. Let's go. I'm nervous. Let's go. So, Jimmy, in your own words, you called yourself a military brat growing up, meaning you had parents in the military. And while it can sound kind of derogatory to the outside world. In the military world, people wear that term with a sort of badge of honor. Usually military brats travel a lot during their childhood and you had seen some weird things as a child, either things that were mysterious or things that not many people outside of the military have seen, such as flares and parachute lights. So as a child, what kind of things did you see to help you rationalize situations or cases that you use for this line of work being the host of Fade to Black Radio? Wow, what a great question. Uh, a great way to start this off, uh, Christina. Uh, okay, uh, let's go to the first part of that, uh, a military brat. And, and I think that you're right. Uh, military brats probably do wear that title as 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 a badge of honor um but there's a weird thing that goes on uh with military families and that is for the most part um you live on base you go to a department of defense school all of your friends uh, are military brats. Everything that you are exposed to is military and Department of Defense. And so growing up, there is a weird thing that happens. You shop on base. Your mom goes to uh, the post exchange for groceries. You go to the post exchange for your clothes and your toys, you go to the movies at a military movie theater. Um, at your, your, your life is on the base. And getting off of base, and especially when you're a kid, is like a big deal, right? There's no McDonald's on, on a base. There isn't any of the, there isn't a shopping mall. There isn't the uh, the commercialized side of life, everything is Department of Defense on the base. So going off of the base and seeing the color and the things um, that are off base, that's like a, a treat. It's like a, a, a big deal uh, to get off base. And if you're five, six, seven years old, you're not driving a car. You're, you can't ever leave the base unless your parents take you. And so you you grow up, in this, this closed thing. And what happens in this closed thing is now your friend's parents, um, you know, sometimes both, usually just the dad, is in the military. He's doing something. He's, he's in the Army. In my case, it was Army. 
although I had friends that uh, in, in other parts of the world where uh, Air Force and Marines and, 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 and the Navy uh, was all, uh, you know, part of our existence. But if you're on an Army base, your friend's dad is doing something in the military. There's all military speak. What does he do? And this, and, and there wasn't this uh, situation where I had a friend's dad who was a salesperson or in the insurance or, or a painter or whatever. No, everything is military driven. And this is the other part that uh, applies to me today with Fade to Black. You're also exposed to secrets. And what I mean by that is you could have uh, a, a friend whose dad just deployed somewhere. Well, you don't talk about that. You know, there's there's a mission that is going on. There is something happening. And all of that is kept private. And it certainly doesn't get off base and go into the public sector. It, it just, it doesn't happen that way. And military families operate that way. So now that I'm in, in, to what I'm doing today in, in hosting a program that discusses a lot of these situations that happen with the Pentagon and with the military. I can look back when, when the audience is demanding, can, the community is demanding information out of the military. This is a difficult thing for the private sector to understand how the military actually operates. And it's a tough, closed down world. And that has been in place for a couple of hundred years, at least with the United States, but certainly military standards uh, have, have been around for thousands of years. And so this cloak of secrecy that we have today with the UFO subject is a strange one. And and the the audience out there that wasn't raised as a military brat doesn't really understand and 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 it's tough to get somebody to understand that because they're demanding this and they're wondering why and why is the air force not cooperating or why is it the navy that is talking and and why do we have to get a uap task force involved why, why the secrecy and and the lies coming from the pentagon all of this is a world that has always been kept separate from the public. And today, the military is trying to figure out a way to navigate through this because, uh, once again, uh, this conversation is being forced. And, and now that it has gone as far as it has, we can't go backwards. And the military can't go backwards. So now they're trying to figure out a way uh, to to work with the public, which they've never done before, and and hopefully move this forward, which is one of the reasons why uh, somebody like Lou Elizondo, who can speak military speak, he can converse that way, and he understands the halls of the Pentagon and, and understands some of the bureaucracy that goes down in Washington, D.C. But he was also a private citizen. And and he is now trying to balance the two, understanding that the public is demanding these things, but there is a way and a methodology uh, to move forward with the Department of Defense. And that's why me being a military brat, I can sit in the middle and, and kind of see both sides and trying to figure out a way that we can all navigate through this together. And let's let's go a little bit deeper into that. Why, in your opinion, is the Navy speaking out about UFOs, but no other branches are, at least publicly? Uh, I would have to say that if we look back, uh, opinions uh, from those out there uh, that have commented on this, uh, I think are all valid. Uh, we don't really have a firm answer. But first off, the Air Force isn't saying a whole lot. And by not saying a whole lot and some of the things that they have done, especially over the last couple of years, um, it, it's, it's, it's setting the course for moving forward. Now, what I mean by that is this. Um, 
publicly, the Air Force shut down Blue Book in 1969. We we now know that the investigations going into the UFO subject, now called UAP today, uh, continued. We now know this. The Air Force had a public position, that's what I just commented on earlier, a public position that there's nothing to see here. We're, we're closing this. Uh, we got nowhere with, with Project Blue Book and investigating UFOs. So that has been the Air Force's position now going on uh, 50 years. Okay, this is 1969. We're in 2022. I'm 58 today. I was born in 1963, so you can do the math, right? It's been about 50 years. And the Department of Defense, with its systems in place, and I'm not talking about uh, anything else except for hardware. So that's radar, that is uh, sonar, that is pilots, that is airplanes, helicopters, Uh, troop transports, bases around the world, submarines, ships. Everybody is observing constantly. We have NORAD in place, a huge, huge radar installation that uh, helps defend all of North America um, looking for missiles, but it's constantly from, from Russia or any adversary for that matter. Constantly scanning the skies, constantly. So they are seeing things all the time. And then we have everything else that is going on in the surface of the United States. And then underneath the water, too, as well, with submarines. We are constantly scanning. Now, the Air Force, which is the protector of the skies, certainly has been collecting data. And Project Blue Book may have been closed in 1969. But they have not stopped defending the skies in 1969. And the same thing with the the Navy, the Marines, and the Army. What we now know today is that um, at the Pentagon, they had a, a, a secure chat room on a secured network where different branches of the military could get together, hang out in this chat room, and talk about UFOs, UAPs. And the Air Force stepped in and told uh, anybody that was in the Air Force not to be involved in that chat room. Now, you have to ask, ask yourself why. It's certainly not a budgetary thing. It's a chat room. There's no money. There isn't anything to worry about here. It's a chat room. It's a sharing of information. The Air Force shut that down. They don't want participation in that. With uh, the UAP task force, we we now know that most of the information that is there, uh, that is being investigated in these different events and things, uh, certainly since the Nimitz in 2004, moving forward, also in the UAP task force report, it uh, stated that a bulk of the cases were from the last two years. Okay, so they have 144 cases that they looked at. We know that the Nimitz is there, and how many events in the Nimitz uh, incident is part of this 144, I don't know. But it does clearly state there that a majority of the cases that were looked at were from the last two years. How many of those were from the Air Force? Probably none. So what is it that the Air Force, A, is withholding, Or B, probably the bigger question is, why do they feel that they don't have to? What is stopping the Air Force? Now, if we go back to 1969 and we take a look at what happened with the closing of Blue Book, if the Air Force is publicly saying that there is nothing there, they are going to continue to toe that line, both in the public eye and privately inside the walls of the Pentagon. And that's that's where they are standing right now. I do find it very interesting that all of the pilots that have come forward, all of the crew members and military personnel that have stepped forward have all been nearly exclusively the United States Navy. 
And I think that the Senate Intelligence Committee obviously is feeling this frustration while they're not getting information out of the Air Force. But now that the Senate Intelligence Committee is aware of this, they are going to turn around and speak to more directly to the Air Force saying, where are your pilots? What have they seen? What kind of data have you collected? What have your sensors picked up? What have your radars picked up? We, um, uh, uh, I'm going to close with this. The Navy has very, a very sophisticated uh, collection of aircraft, certainly aircraft carriers and the equipment, the electronic equipment that is on an F-18 Hornet or anything that launches off of the deck of an aircraft carrier is pretty sophisticated. But it's not as sophisticated as what the Air Force has. So if the Navy doesn't have any issues with, with these sightings and tracking them and going on location, certainly the Air Force has more advanced electronic warfare capabilities, and they have been out there seeing uh, at least as much, of, if not more, than the Navy, but they're not sharing that information, and they're telling their pilots not to talk about it. We now know this, and so does the Senate Intelligence Committee, and I can expect a change in attitude moving forward, probably uh, much sooner than later. I sure do hope so. Now, let's get back to you. What made you want to start a paranormal, supernatural UFO radio show? You were originally a sports radio host, so that jump from sports to the mysterious is a pretty big jump. What made you change? It was, it was my plan. It was my plan. It was my plan all along. And, and, I, and I understand <laughs> it sounds a little strange. But uh, but I grew up listening to late night radio, and and I loved talk radio, and I love watching the news and and newscasters, and you know I had my little music career going on, and and things were fine, and and I was uh, uh, doing art. I was in the art world. That's what paid my rent, my bills. But but it was this thing that I had from when I was a little kid. Uh, it was talk radio. It was the news and newspapers and, and journalism. And I, I was just so impressed with it. And I didn't know how, but I knew that eventually that's where I would end up. I, I just didn't know how I was going to pull it off. But, uh, but in listening to late night radio and certainly uh, Art Bell and Coast to Coast uh, uh, were something that uh, I listened to a lot from the second that they, they came on the air here in, in Los Angeles. I was right there and I was listening. I thought, wow, this is this is great. I in the back of my mind. And, you know, I know I've mentioned this uh, many times, but it it's it's worth repeating. I lived across the street from Coast. Right. And I knew it was going on in the building right there. And uh, and I thought to myself, I'm 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 going to host that show. I'm 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 going to do that. I just didn't know how, but you know, I put it out there to the universe, and I just manifested it. But here's the deal. So when I uh, I went back to school, and I uh, went to CSB, and uh, for radio and television and and other stuff. Um, video and editing and the, the the classes that you take, you know, for uh, for broadcast journalism. And while I was there, I had uh, contacted uh, the local sports radio station here in LA, the big one, and uh, I had things in play. What I knew were the facts. There was only one coast to coast. There's only one gig over there. There's only one in the sports world. There's all kinds. In fact, I can go anywhere. Oops, oops, oops. I'm right, excited. I can go anywhere. So if there was a way for me to get my career started, get it jump started, and, and do it via sports, I could get into radio and then make my move. And so my initial plan, uh, well, that was successful. Uh, th that worked. But then um, after a couple of years, I decided to start 
another show that would still do maybe sports, but maybe food and entertainment and conspiracy. And that was going to be called uh, Jimmy Church Against the World. And I could incorporate all of this and then slowly weed out sports and maybe weed out everything else and then just focus on UFOs and conspiracy. And, and that was the plan. And it was the plan early on. And and it, it just happened to work. I was I was at the right place at the right time. And that's what it's all about. Jimmy, we're coming towards a break. We'll be right back. Million gigawatt paranormal powerhouse KUNX DB VX. This is Micah Hanks of the Micah Hanks program right here on KUNX, and right now you're having your paradigm shifted by the one and only Christina Gomez. in the paranormal then you'll love the unxnetwork.com the x is your streaming audio and video for everything supernatural strange and mysterious like ufos bigfoot ghosts and so much more from hosts like jimmy church whitley streamer micah hanks and christina gomez visit the unxnetwork.com show page for a complete list of all the paranormal programs you'll find on the x be sure to follow us on Twitter for updates at KUNXDB. Follow our Facebook group, UNX Network. Find the podcast on Spotify, iHeart, Audible, and Apple Podcast. It's time. It's new. It's the X. X. Hi. Hi. This is Race Hobbs, head of programming at the new UNX Network. And you're locked on Shifting the Paradigm with the intrepid Christina, Christina Gomez. Gomez. On, on the ass. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You love the new Paranormal Radio app from Talk Stream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in paranormal talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. Howdy folks, this is Lou Elizondo and you are listening to my very good friend Christina Gomez on Shifting the Paradigm. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. I'm going to 
Shifting the Paradigm. My guest today is Jimmy Church from Fade to Black Radio. And you mentioned that you were a host for Coast to Coast AM on the weekends from 2014 until 2020. And you mentioned that you lived right across the street from the studio and your phone number was one digit off from That's theirs. Right. That's right. That is trippy, or as you say, synchronicity. You then state that if you create your own reality, if you place intention on the things that you want, you can achieve it. And you're a firsthand witness to that. How can people be in charge of their reality? You have to, uh, you have to focus. Uh, that and I, and I know that sounds a little um maybe even esoteric and 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 a little bit out there but you have to focus and without going off into crystals and meditation and manifesting and you know, the universe is 100% connected it absolutely is and if you if you choose to not do something it's never going to happen it's really that simple if you focus if you focus you don't even have to say the words put it in your head but if you focus then if it's going to happen that's the way it's going to get done if you don't do that well nothing's going to happen there was um uh, a very very famous quote by Mick Jagger. And I read this myself. And uh, so I'm reading this interview. It's Rolling Stone magazine. And and this interviewer asked Mick, so how, how do you explain the success of the Rolling Stones? And I know what the interview is. The interviewer is thinking, this is just such a smart question. And I'm going to get the most in-depth philosophical answer out of Mick Jagger with this brilliant question. Mick Jagger replies, we kept the band together, <laughs> right? <laughs> the band didn't break up. Now, it's the same thing. Whatever you want to do, with, with, if, however you want to chart your future and chase your bliss and find it, You've got to focus on it because if you don't, it's not going to happen. And it's the same thing with the success with the Rolling Stones, Christina. The band didn't break up. If the band would have broke up, there's no success. It's really that simple. It's not the songs. It's not how we negotiated with the record company. It's not how we dealt with the fans. It's not how we, you know, the, the, the world hunger, whatever you want to put on the table. It wasn't any of that. The band just didn't break up. And it's the same thing. If you want to do something, chart the course, put it in your mind, and then it can happen. If you don't do that, it simply won't. Well, just like Mick Jagger and the Rolling Stones being persistent, you yourself have been incredibly persistent as you've done about 1,560 shows in an eight-year span. That is an insane amount of shows. In that time, what has been one of the most valuable things that you've learned? The most valuable thing that I have learned, well, there's, there, there's a lot of valuable things uh, that I have learned. The, the man, men have died. Countries have fallen for the words I'm about to say. <laughs> and the, the, you know, the first thing, um, that you learn, I mean, the most valuable thing that you can learn is just be yourself. Th that's, that's it. Just be yourself. Figure out a way to get your brain connected to your jaw and be that person. Be yourself. Don't try to be somebody else. Don't try to emulate somebody you've listened to for years and 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 you think that that's what people want you to be don't go down that road figure out a way to be yourself and the and that's one of the biggest secrets if uh if i could share any piece of knowledge it's just be yourself you know just be yourself when when uh when you're at a party or you're hanging out with friends at work or school whatever 
And there's a moment when you're talking and your mind goes blank, your jaws flapping, and then you're done saying what you're saying. And then your friends are just staring at you. They're like, man, that was, that was, that was amazing. And you, and, and you don't, that's, that's the zone. That's you just being yourself. And that, whatever that is, that's what you swing over when you're on the microphone. Because the person that you're listening to and, and seeing right now is the same person that you're going to hang out with uh, if you're ever alone with me. It's the same person, same voice, same thoughts, same words. I don't have some crazy vocabulary. I don't. Uh, I don't do anything, you know, I, I, I am just me. And that's what happens on the air. That that's like the most crucial thing. That's the one thing that I've learned. The second most important, there's a long list, but if I was going to put these in order, the second most important thing that I've learned is I talk. I listen I'm not on the internet. I talk and I listen. I'm not on the internet. And so you just said, I didn't even know the numbers were up there. You said 1,500 shows. I've probably done another two, three, 400 over on Coast to Coast. Um, I don't know how many TV shows. I don't know how many other shows I've done as a guest that I've been invited on. I don't know what that number is. But uh, each one of those events, every single one, was three or four hours not on the internet. Holy crap. That will change a person. So over, I think you said uh, 2014, I started on Coast. I started uh, Fade to Black in 2013. I started Sports in 2008. Okay, we're in 2022, so it's 14, almost 15 years later, where uh, those days I have spent three or four hours or more per day, not on the internet, not on it. I have been engaging in conversation, and that has allowed me to grow. I mean, grow. And I, if I could suggest one thing to just about anybody, imagine putting down your phone, mandatory, right? <laughs> because from 7 p.m. till 10 p.m. each night, my phone's off. So just imagine if you had to, as a private citizen, 7 to 10 p.m., man, this thing shuts off, shuts off. You have to go and talk to somebody. Talk to your kids, talk to your spouse, talk to your neighbor, talk to anybody for three hours a night. Just imagine how people would be different today. And, and I've realized that. I look back and I think about the blessing that I was given because of this job and this career where I don't look at my phone. I don't do it. So there you go. There, there's two, two parting Two parting pieces of wisdom. And you've spoken to a lot of researchers, experiencers, and enthusiasts in the UFO field. A lot of them with similar ideas and some with conflicting on the ideas on who or what these things that we are seeing really are. From your experiences and from your research, which case has to be the most compelling or one that is the most divided? Ooh, okay. Which one do you want first? The most compelling. The most compelling case. Ew, man, can I say that's like a tie with like five? If I was going to go with like compelling, 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 I got to go Rendlesham. Um, and I go with Rendlesham, the Rendlesham Forest case uh, for a lot of different reasons. Um, but Probably the most important part is that it's military and we have military witnesses and we have military paperwork and documents and things that have uh, uh, been revealed to support this case since then. Uh, so I would say Rendlesham, but for another important reason, 
it's a modern case. Now I realize it's it's forty years old now, which is crazy to me. And uh, but the witnesses are still with us. Everybody is still here. Everybody that was a part of Rendlesham is still here today. When we look at Betty and Barney Hill, they're not with us anymore. Uh, Roswell, uh, they're not with us anymore. You know, and you look at some of these very important historical cases, those witnesses are no longer with us. So Rendlesham is an opportunity for us to uh, continue the dialogue and continue the research. And again, it was a military, uh, a military case from the beginning, an event from the beginning. And I, I think that is there. But right on the heels of that, I've got to go with Travis Walton. And uh, for the very same reasons uh, for Rendlesham, in that Travis is still with us. Uh, most of the logging crew uh, and the other initial witnesses and his family members and things all still with us. Um, tremendously documented, um, uh, poured over, studied, and researched cases in history. And, and Travis is still here. So uh, compelling. I'm going to go Rendlesham first because of the military aspect of it uh, and the support there. And then Travis Walton, I think, are, are the two most compelling cases for me. Now, uh, the second part. Oh, conflicting. Conflicting case. <laughs> uh, all of them. Uh, a conflicting case. Hmm. Hmm. I'm going to go Tic Tac. I'm going to go the I'm going to go Nimitz. I'm going to go with Nimitz on this. I'm going to go with the Nimitz case. Now, uh for a lot of the same reasons for for Rendlesham and uh Travis Walton. All the witnesses are with us. Uh we have uh not only the personnel that were part of the ships, but we have the pilots and we have some corroborating video data, even though it's not specifically David Fravor's incident that is in the videos. Um, but we have some supporting video evidence there. And of course, everything that has happened since, but it's conflicting. Is it ours? Is it theirs? Is it real? Is it not? Is it uh, radar anomalies? What did Fravor see with his eyes? Was it something else? Was it some kind of technology? Was it uh, holograms from Russia uh, being projected by uh, a submarine? I'm making that up. I have no data to back that up. But is it that? We don't know. We honestly don't know. One of the most conflicting cases out there. And when you, when you talk to Kevin Day and you talk to David Fravor and, of course, Sean Cahill, uh, was just on the show recently, too, as well. Um, and you listen to the way that they look at this. Um, I'm not so sure that anybody's got any clear answers um, in this case. Um, the If one thing has divided the community, it is uh, the Tic Tac case. Uh, it is... It is, yeah, conflicting. I think that's a great word. Yeah, it's definitely conflicting. So I'm going to go Tic Tac. That's an interesting one. Another person you recently had on the show is Don Schmidt, a head researcher on what happened in Roswell in 1947. What kind of information did you both cover? And is there anything new or previously unknown by the mass majority about this famous case? Yeah, uh, Don Schmidt, um, uh, who may have the greatest hair in all of ufology, by the way. Don Schmidt is somebody that I met uh, right when I started uh, Fade to Black. And, and Don and I uh, became friends. And uh, I think that we understand each other. And I've just got a, a huge amount of respect. First off, I've read all of his books before I, I had ever met him. And, and here I am, the new guy, you know, in, in, in broadcast. And 
And I think that the, the two of us, and you find this out about somebody very quickly uh, when you sit down and, and talk with them, you can tell if you're going to gel. You can just tell if you will be able to just talk about anything and you're going to have a good time doing it. And and Don and I hit it off. And uh, so because of that, he has allowed me, and it goes both ways though, but he has allowed me to uh, to push the issue with him, uh, to maybe step outside of of boundaries. Um, and but I think it's because of our mutual respect for each other. And he definitely, I know this sounds weird because he's he's always wearing a suit and his hair is perfect and he's always shaved and he's got the nice teeth. You know, and he just looks all prim and proper. The dude is one of the funniest people I've ever been around. He really, really honestly makes me laugh. That being said, he's a walking encyclopedia. He's a walking pillar of knowledge. Not only uh, before Roswell ever came along, he was working with J. Allen Hynek. And he had his feet deep in the water early on and, and trying to figure this out. He uh, faced uh, the storm of, uh, you know, different debates and things and Larry King live and CNN and just just out there, uh, it, you know, facing the battle. And w the way that he has dealt with Roswell um, ever since is he knows more about that case probably than anybody else in the world right now. And that says a lot because you have Kevin Randall out there and. And, and certainly other great researchers like uh, Richard Dolan and Stanton Friedman, who is the original investigator and researcher and author on the case, um, is, is no longer with us. But Linda Moulton, how there's plenty out there that know an absolute uh, huge amount uh, on Roswell. But it is Don Schmidt that is at the center of everything. And the community of Roswell, and I've done this. Uh, the community of Roswell has uh, holds him up. He could run for mayor. He could run for mayor of Roswell tomorrow and win. His family is in Wisconsin, and that's where he lives. But 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 the the uh, the amount of work that he put into Roswell, the the amount of time he has spent, and as as much time he he has. Uh, spent defending this case and and keeping it alive, and that is with governors and senators and Congress people and Washington and of course the media and, and books. Um, he uh, he has fought the good fight, and he will not stop. And that's the one thing uh, that every time he's on the show, I think the audience really gets a dose of who Don Schmidt really is. And, and how much information he's uh, sitting on. And he is simply not going to stop. He's not going to do it. Now, new revelations. You know, even for myself, uh, Don was on the show this week. And as much as I know about Roswell, I decided not to take notes. I didn't want to have anything on my screens that are here in front of me. And I insisted that he do the same. We were just going to talk. And we were going to start from the beginning to the end. And one of the things that escaped me, Christina, um, and I, this happened live on the air, that there were three crash sites. Now, I've read, I've read this over and over again over the years. But for Don to drive that home when he said, no, no, Jimmy, stop. The first spot was the debris field a couple of miles away were two bodies that were found out in the middle of the desert. And then the main impact site was 30 miles away. So there were three sites at Roswell. And that is so important. So for me, I was like, oh, man, that's right. But if I make that revelation live on the air, Christina, so does the entire audience, where they can sit back and go, oh, wait a minute. That's right. There was more to Roswell. It's not – I have – um. I have, uh, I wish you could see it in here. I have one here and I have one up on the wall. I have the 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 signs, Roswell crash site. Don't ask me where I got them. But, you know, with an arrow pointing. 
That's not the crash site. That's the impact site, right? And 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 having Don reveal that, or um, uh, how should I say this? Discuss this part of the case once again on the show was something that slipped by me during the interview. And I think that the audience picked up on that and they went along with me on that ride going three. There were three sites. So that's why Don Schmidt is one of my favorite guests. He's just a, a walking Roswell pillar of knowledge. There is a lot of information there. From all the information that you've combed through, what has to be the most compelling when it comes to Roswell? The most compelling piece of, of well, yeah, it's the it's the press release. It's the original press release. Don and I talked about this briefly. I mean, we both agreed that that is probably the one thing about Roswell that that stands above everything else, and that's the witness testimony, and that's the debris, and and everything else that we have uh, is the press release. And and I'll, I'll just keep this brief. The reason why that is, if if I was in court. I'm at the Supreme Court, and we are pushing our Roswell evidence in, into the center of the table. I don't bring a witness. I don't do that. I don't have to show the photograph of Jesse Marcel with the weather balloon in Fort Worth, Texas. I don't need to do any of that. I just push that press release forward and put that in the middle of the table because that forces the issue. Because that press release was written at the most secretive, technically advanced place on planet Earth in 1947. That was Roswell Army Airfield, period. That's it. That's the most secretive place in the world. And if they are going to do a press release about a flying saucer being recovered, you can bet that it was poured over line by line, sanitized, and written correctly so this could go out to the press for the rest of the world. That's it. There were no mistakes made. That's it. Now, the retraction that comes later, the original press release, that's it. That's the most important piece of the Roswell case. I will have to agree with you. I think that little bit of information, that little bit of evidence, it's really hard to kind of brush off that case and being like, oh, it's nothing worth looking into. So I, I agree with you right there. Changing gears a little bit, let's talk about Antarctica. You have been looking into this topic for some time and you've had a handful of guests that specialize in the topic. For those that may not know much about the topic, why are people looking into Antarctica since the time of about World War II? Because nobody can go there. That's why. That's why. <laughs> it, 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 why was everybody interested in Area 51? Because you couldn't go there. It didn't exist, right? Anytime you tell the public uh, this is off limits, well, you have just uh, 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 put all the attention on it. Uh, that you can handle. And that's that's the deal with Antarctica. You you can't really book passage there. Uh, you can't, you know, jump on uh, Qantas uh, Airlines in, in Sydney, Australia and wing it down for the weekend and 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 stay at a, a, a Hilton hotel. You, no, no, it's 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 not about that. So uh, there's that. And then the other part is, even if you could get yourself down to Antarctica, and you can go down to the southern tip of uh, Argentina and and book a boat, and you can go down and, and, and cruise for, for a week and come back, um, you might be able to land at a couple of the research stations and, and go hang out with a couple of people. But that's it. Now, can you jump on a snow cat and, uh, and, and ride a couple hundred miles in? No, can't do it. Can't you, you? You simply can't. Can you book an aircraft? Can you fly around Antarctica? No, you can't. Jump on Google Earth and swing down to Antarctica. Go to the South Pole, and you will see that it's all blanked out. Now you know it's photographed. You know there's imagery. You know that uh, they're researching it. 
uh, all all over, but they're not sharing that information. And it's this big secrecy. So that's where the interest is. Now, but there's a part two to this. Antarctica. And, and we'll, we'll get to part two, but Jimmy, there's a break. We'll be right back after this. Million gigawatt paranormal powerhouse KUNX DB BX. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you are in the future because you're listening to Christina Gomez and shifting the paradigm. Race Hobbs with the X. Obviously, if you're listening to this, you have an interest in unexplained phenomena like ghosts, Bigfoot, and UFOs. And by now, you know that we have our own X blog, the UnX newsletter, and the UnX magazine quarterly. But most of you don't know that we have started our very own paranormal conference. And this year, for safety, this two day XCon will be virtual. So you can attend from the comfort of your home. XCon presenters include Whitley Strieber, Micah Hanks, Mark. GK and Preston Dennett, Jimmy Church, Lisa Martin and Wayne Lawrence, Lee Spiegel, Debbie Zegelmeyer, Dan Terry, Kate Grabowski, and Ray Hernandez. There will also be a live paranormal investigation by the Riverside, Iowa Paranormal Team. So come hang out with us in the safety of home as we set out to explain the unexplained Friday, May 13th, and Saturday the 14th, 2022. And tickets are on sale now. Go to unexnetwork.com. That's unexnetwork.com. Are you ready to read about true paranormal events? Unex Media publishes nonfiction books about UFOs, ghosts and haunted places, time anomalies, cryptid creatures, and more. Just like KUNXDB Radio, it's all about unexplained phenomena. Visit www.unxmedia.com to see our list of great book titles by Debbie Ziegelmeyer, Gene Walker, Devin Listrom, Wayne Lawrence, Bill Spicer, and yours truly, Margie Kay. That's unxmedia.com. Gold loves chaos, uncertainty, and disarray. History shows us what gold does when people aren't sure, aren't sure about the government, the stock market, their jobs, or their retirement savings. Our national debt is skyrocketing. Gold and other precious metals are a defense measure against inflation and a stock market that might take years to recover. So what can you do right now to protect yourself? Call United Gold Group. We offer gold and other precious metals delivered securely within 72 hours. Are you worried about the stock market? We can also help you set up a real gold or silver IRA or a 401k. Safe and secure. United Gold Group makes gold ownership affordable. Call now and get up to $2,500 in free gold or silver with a qualified IRA. Call 800-753-8534. That's 800-753-8534 or visit unitedgoldgroup.com.
about Antarctica, and you have a part two. So what what does that entail? It, it, it's this. We have uh, the the continental shift, uh, the uh, the plate shift that has formed what we now know as 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 planet Earth, right? The different continents and where everything is. And we know now that at, at one point everything was connected. It broke apart, and you can see the puzzle pieces, right? Well, it's the same thing with Antarctica. So did Antarctica move to where it is now? Was it in a more tropical environment at one point? Now, it appears that we have all of the archaeological evidence and record to show that it was a lush environment. There were, there were plants and trees and things that were down there. How much of that and how long was it existed in an area where there may have been civilization? Is it possible that whoever built Gobekli Tepe, for, for instance, that a previous advanced, technically advanced society on this planet, could they have lived in Antarctica? Is there evidence of that? Well, right now it's underneath ice and snow. And if there has been a discovery of that, uh, the public doesn't know about it. But eventually, something is going to be found down there. And when it does, it is clearly because of where Antarctica is. And I'm going to jump back to one more thing. That's the Perry Reese map. But uh, where Antarctica is, if somebody lived, if, you know, if there's a city underneath the ice there, then that means it's tens of millions or older years old. And that is crazy. Now, do, does the, uh, do the governments of the world want us to know that? Do religions of the world want us to know that? You, you can't keep it hidden forever, but I think that there is something going on there. There's another piece to this. There's number two. And that is the Perry Reese map. The Perry Reese map, which uh, was discovered, it's not the original. Uh, the Perry Reese map is a copy of other maps that came out of the Middle East, uh, specifically, possibly Istanbul, Turkey. The Perry Reese map shows Antarctica in the year 1300. Antarctica wasn't first seen by us until the Russians saw it in 1817. They only saw it from the ocean. They could see it. Oh, okay, we've got a continent now. We've got something down here. That was in 1817. How is it? It wasn't seen, Christina, until 1817. What was Perry Reese copying? Now, he was dealing with these maps in uh, throughout the Middle East, Persia, uh, Turkey, and he was going and he was copying the maps, copying them. So that means that the maps pre-existed Perry Reese and, and that map. So how is that possible? So it would su strongly suggest to me that uh, somebody was living down there in Antarctica, lived down there for a long time, number one. There's that possibility. Or number two, somebody saw Antarctica from space. Now, that gets a little out there. It gets a little out there, but it is perfectly drawn, and it's perfectly mapped out. So Antarctica is, is there. It's a big secret. Um, I think that there is going to be a big reveal at some point. Is it going to be the rumors that we've heard in the past? Is it going to be Project High Jump? Is it going to be a, a secret Nazi base? Is it going to be underground reptilians and Anunnaki and an enter to the hollow entrance to the hollow earth? I don't know about any of that, but they're certainly keeping it a secret. There have been so many theories on what is going on in Antarctica. Moving away from Antarctica, you are the narrator of the film Extraordinary the Revelations, released last year. What made you want to become a part of that film? They paid me. And here's the deal. I've always 
wanted to narrate a film. And as dry as this may sound, I listen to narrators. I listen to them. And if you go back to uh, Chariots of the Gods, uh, when that was released, I think two or three people, uh, different narrators in that film, all great. But, but I'm, I'm, I'm nine years old and, and I'm watching the film. I'm listening to the narrators, you know, and, and listening to narration over the years. Um, again, it goes back to what I suggested earlier. If there's something that you want to do, focus on that. And narrating a film was one of the things that I wanted to do. And uh, when the opportunity came up uh, with uh, J3 Films, and they're just, they're great over there. John Sumple, great director, and Lori Wagner, and, and the whole crew, I, without going down uh, the entire list. Uh, Jamie, and man, just, just, just a great bunch of people. But when they came to me and said, we would like for you to narrate the film, um, I immediately spoke uh, to my agent, Jeff, and I said, Jeff, make this happen. I want to narrate this film. And so what they had done, before I even said that to Jeff, they they sent me the rough of the film. And, and I watched it. I said, okay, this, this uh, yes, 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 yes. I, I, I want to do this film. So Jeff made it happen, and uh, I was so excited. Um, and the reason why I wanted to narrate this film instead of something else, and there'll be other projects in the future. And as a matter of fact, I'm talking to two or three uh, companies right now uh, about doing narration, right? Okay. But here's the deal. The way that J3 Films and uh, the team there wanted to approach this was have three different uh, fields of experts. and a historical uh, perspective, possibly uh, a military uh, research and religious um, uh, and, and have these different takes on uh, what these revelations have been with the subject of UFOs and, and contact with ET. And, and I really, I saw it. I saw the way that they planned this out. And I thought, yes, okay, if I can be the voice of that for each one of these sections of the film, and I could be like the fifth beetle, and I don't have to brush my teeth, I don't have to shave, I don't have to dress up, I can just hide behind the microphone and, and do some storytelling. I wanted to be a part of this film, and it was uh, one of those things. It's a bucket list, um, and the film just turned out to be amazing, and, and it's just won a whole pile of awards. It's a, it's a great film. And on the topic of films, I saw on Twitter that you recently watched Moonfall. Mm -hmm. I, too, just watched it a few days ago. What did you think about the movie? And for those that have not seen or heard of it, what is it about without giving away any spoilers? Uh, what is it about the film? That Roland Emmerich listens to Fade to Black. <laughs> that's, that's, what, that's, that's it. It was, it was crazy for me. Um, I decided, uh, I watched the film on, on Friday, I think. Um, I decided earlier today, I had a very busy day here leading, leading up to what we're doing. And uh, I'm going to watch Moonfall again. It, it's, it, it's, it's that good. Now, the, um, there's an origin story I'm not going to get into. Uh, that is there, which reminded me so much of uh, Fade to Black over the years and also how my views have uh, maybe not so much changed but have adjusted uh, to what is going on. And then uh, certainly uh, the moon, and I've always uh, uh, compared it to the Death Star uh, in Star Wars. Not to say that that is what's going on here, uh, because, well, I'm not going to say if it is or it isn't. You have to watch the film. But but is there something else going on with the moon? Because it is uh, at the right place, at the right time, to make sure that you and I are able to talk right now. 
right? That that's that's it's perfect. So how does that happen? That's Moonfall. Uh, in, incredible, incredible movie. I mean, and you know what? Um, I know that you've seen it. And uh, right now, I, I'm not hosting this show. And it's very hard for me not to ask questions. But holy crap, Christina. It, 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 scene after scene after scene after scene, the, the film never lets up. And it, uh, it's not only in the action and things, but it's constantly making your mind work. And I really enjoyed that about the film. It made me think. Yeah, it's, 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 it's truly a great film. And Roland Emmerich, I'm so glad that you're a fade or not. I thoroughly enjoyed the movie. I mean, when I was watching it, I was thinking the whole time about the show that we did, Mysteries of the Moon. And I'm just thinking, oh, my goodness, everything that we covered is in the is in the film. Yeah. yeah. And, and it was a lot of fun. It was very entertaining. The the um, videography, the costumes, I mean, everything was just superb. It was such a well done movie. I want I want to do a spoiler, but I can't. But I was waiting. Uh, I'm not going to do it. I'm just not going to the film. Don't did, do it. Don't do it. I'm not, not going to do it. But um, the anticipation of seeing E.T. or Roland Emmerich's version of E.T. Yes. Was, man, that was too much suspense for me. I mean, I was losing my mind. And then, so then, so the movie's over. I'm literally, I'm, here's the spoiler. Um, I was uh, thinking to myself, well, uh, oh, I get it. Well done, Emmerich. Well done. And that's all I'm going to say. That's all I'm going to say. That's all I'm going to say. We'll leave that right there. It, it, was, it was such a good movie. Now, who, in your opinion, has been the most influential to bring this ufo and paranormal topic to the front lines uh, it's a that's a that's a tough call if we uh, let me answer that uh in two two different ways if we if we look at overall like awareness of of et and things today i mean overall really probably seriously whitley streber whitley streber communion the grays the face the cover the the thing that that <sighs> worldwide Probably Whitley Strieber did more to bring this question into the public than anybody else. And man, 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 it's an honor and a privilege for me to call him friend. I just texted with him this morning, and uh, he's amazing. He's absolutely amazing. Now, that's on that scale. I'm talking about historically where we are today with it. Uh, um, so I would say Whitley Strieber uh, we have a great amount of of debt and and gratitude that we we owe him. So, but in in a modern context today, um, with you know, probably probably the missteps of of Tom DeLong uh, did an awful lot uh, to bring awareness today. And when I say missteps, uh, he he had an opportunity right there with TTSA and. And uh, to take this thing uh, to, to levels that would have just been stratospheric, um, there were mistakes that were made, and TTSA is, is now a shell of its former self. But out of TTSA certainly came uh, the New York Times, um, <laughs> Tucker Carlson, and of course, Lou Elizondo and Chris Mellon. And without TTSA and, and Tom DeLong. Uh, we wouldn't have had the UAP task force. We wouldn't have the attention right now with the Senate Intelligence Committee. We wouldn't have the Gillibrand Amendment, and we wouldn't have things moving forward like we are right now. So we've got two different ways to look at this. Overall, probably Whitley Strieber, uh, to put us where we are today. And then uh, over the last two or three years, uh, TTSA, but underneath that umbrella. So I will put it right on Tom DeLong. I would say Tom DeLong, and then, uh, but underneath that, of course, it's uh, Chris Mellon and Lou Elizondo, and and what they have done because whew, 
I, I just I can't imagine being where we are today if it wasn't for the efforts of uh, those two gentlemen, for sure. I will agree with you on that one. TTSA did bring a lot to the table, and now we kind of have the remnants of that. And I think because of Lua Elizondo and Chris Mellon, a lot has happened. Well, let In me, okay, now this is where I'm going to interrupt you, because there's two names, the, 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 the researchers out there today, right? I could just go down the list. I could just go down the list and name so many people. But, but there are two people out there. Um, one, Stanton Friedman, who uh, through all of his television appearances and, and, and videos and books and, and what he done as the face, the sensible face of ufology. He's not wearing a tinfoil hat. He's a physicist. He's a nuclear physicist and uh, somebody with an educated background, right? Somebody that could speak <laughs> and use words. And, and so we had Stan Friedman there as the face of, of ufology that, uh, again, uh, some of the images of this community um, has been, you know, laughed at and, and, and created over the years. Stanton, Stanton fixed that for us, or at least kind of centered us uh, a little bit more. And he was the face of ufology. But we have Richard Dolan. And the reason why I say this is Richard is somebody, you see him speak, you see his face, and if you're a critic, if you're a debunker, if you're a non-believer, if you don't know anything about ufology, but you hear and see Richard speaking, you're like, okay, this guy, this guy's sensible, right? He's not crazy. He's not wearing a tinfoil hat. He's actually sounds like he knows what he's talking about. And when Richard did his 10 minutes uh, speech at the citizen hearing in Washington, D.C. at the press club, that 10 minutes is one of the most compelling, amazing, comprehensive 10 minutes on the subject of what we are dealing with today when it comes to UFOs that has ever been done in the, in the history of ufology. And I have uh, introduced Richard um, at, at just about every conference, uh, probably every conference that we have uh, done over the years. And I will continue to do that. But when I introduce Richard every time, I bring up those 10 minutes at, at the citizens hearing. And the reason why I bring that up, that video, which has been watched, you know, I don't know, millions of times, is something that when people see that, he is the face of us. He's representing us. And he is put right on his shoulders and he's carrying us on his back with that. And so uh, with, with, you know, Elizondo and Mellon, yes, absolutely. And then, yeah, Tom DeLong, great. Stanton Friedman, yeah. Richard Dolan has done more uh, to, to make us look sane, and and positive uh, than just about anybody else uh, in in the history of ufology. So uh, a lot a lot of debt is 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 owed to Richard Dolan. I just have one final question for you. One question that I have to ask, and I mean this one question we cannot avoid. How do you make your famous Jimmy ramen? What is the secret recipe? <laughs> I love to cook. I love to cook. So uh, today, um, thank you for asking, Christina. So today, I had a very busy day. I, I did uh, an, uh, some other interviews. I did uh, a voiceover session. Uh, I did some production work. Uh, I approved artwork. A uh, uh, couple of phone calls. Uh, I, I, all that—that that was my day. But I also made an amazing red sauce. So today, I've got my speakerphone going, and I'm in the kitchen, and I'm making this um, uh, red sauce and uh, Italian sausage, which I seasoned myself, and and I'm uh, sautéing peppers and onions and and mushrooms in a separate pan. I've got my sauce uh, coming back over here and I've got that going on and then I'm combining everything and boom, done. 
And wow, right? From scratch, I love to cook. But I also love ramen noodles. And uh, I can't do ramen straight. Doesn't matter. Does it, 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 it doesn't matter. I need to protein my ramen. Now, if I was going to, and it doesn't matter if it's a cup of noodles or it's an actual import Japanese ramen thing from Japan or Australia or whatever. I've got all that stuff, too. And uh, Christina can t- attest to this fact. But I can't do it straight. I, I, I can't. I have to protein it. Now, my favorite ramen, now look, adding shrimp, great. Adding chicken, great. We can all do that. Add uh, uh, Italian meatballs to ramen is a great, uh, that's a great meal. But my favorite ramen dish is to take chicken ramen, chicken ramen with a little chicken flavor packet. And I get a can of chili. It could be beans or no beans, but a can of chili. And so I cook up the ramen, and then I take the chili and put in a couple of hefty tablespoons of chili into the ramen, stir it up, put that back in the microwave for about 30 seconds to reheat it, pull that out, and then Parmesan cheese, black pepper, and red chili flakes on the top of that. And that is my favorite ramen. Coming to coming to you from a guy that just made a scratched red sauce today. Scratch red sauce. Ramen noodles, canned chili, Parmesan cheese, black pepper, chili, chili flakes. And I'm about as happy as anybody on this planet when that... Mm. So there you go. Well, I wrote down those ingredients and I'll probably be making that at some point in time. Jimmy, we have come to the end of the show. Thank you so much for being my guest and as always being so generous with your time to talk with me. So I want to say thank you. Thank you, Christina. And 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 here's the deal. Um, don't ever change. Keep doing what you're doing. The questions are great, but what I really enjoy uh, with you is that you, uh, again, just like Richard Dolan is heading the charge, you're doing the same thing. And you're, you're bringing your generation into this. They understand you. They understand your curiosity and the way that you approach all of this. And I know that it's genuine and it's real. And, and I can't wait to see where you are in five or 10 years with this subject. And and uh, you're going to be uh, one of the leaders of, of this community moving forward. So thank you, Christina. It was, mm. it was great being here with you. Thank you. And my last question, I guess, last, last, last question is, where can people find you online? Oh, man. Come on. Yeah. Uh, just uh, uh, Google, uh, Google Jimmy Church. It's just JimmyChurchRadio.com. Very simple. If you go there, everything that you want to do or need uh, with the show um, is there. You know, we have uh, we have archives. We have uh, a membership area that is there. There's a live player uh, there, so you can listen to the show for free um, every single night. And and that was. Uh, let me say this uh, in departing. The idea for Fade to Black from the very beginning was to make it just like any other radio station on AM radio. You jump in the car, you turn it on, you're listening to the radio, and it's free, right? All you have to do is endure the commercials, right? So if there was a way to, and so that's what we've done. So we got the little AM dial there at uh, jimmychurchradio.com. You can listen to the show for free every single night. You just got to sit through those commercials. I pay the bills around here. But if you want to go further beyond that, there are ways to listen to the show without the commercials and ways that you can do other things. That's up to you. Uh, But we've left those options available to everybody. But whatever you want to do with uh, Fade to Black and and the show is available at uh, JimmyChurchRadio.com. 
Thanks, Jimmy. You're listening to the UnX Network. KUNX DB, Kansas City, Missouri. This is Micah Hanks of the Micah Hanks program right here on KUNX. And right now, you're having your paradigm shifted by the one and only Christina Gomez. I hope you enjoyed today's show. Jimmy never fails to bring his A game. I want to wish you all a wonderful week. Please like this video or podcast on your platform of choice and share it with those who have the same interest. Subscribe if you haven't already because there's a lot more great shows coming to you soon. Be safe and remember, keep your eyes on the skies.